So this is where we stopped last time in the previous video. So now we need to take the derivative of z of x in order to continue with our proof. So taking the derivative, we get, so for the region where x is larger than 0, the derivative is just equal to negative kb e to the power of negative kx. So this is for x is larger than 0. And then for x is smaller than 0, we get b times k e to the power of positive kx. And then we actually don't know what's going to happen when x is equal to 0 because the, the derivative isn't actually very well defined. So one way you can understand this is because this whole term here over here can actually be re rewritten as something like this, negative k times the absolute value of x. So if you know the absolute value of x, if you take the derivative of this, this is, actu this is actually not very well defined at x is equal to 0. So at x is equal to 0, the absolute value of x is itself is well defined but the derivative is not. So this problem kind of just carries over to this function over here. So you see that at x is equal to 0, we actually don't know what the derivative should be. But it doesn't really matter because all we're trying to do is substitute in positive epsilon and negative epsilon. So we'll only, uh, we're only considering the derivative in these two regions, and we're never considering the point at x is equal to 0. So this doesn't really affect our proof over here. So continuing with this, so let's try to substitute an epsilon for this expression. So when you substitute an epsilon, epsilon is going to be larger than 0. So when you substitute this into the derivative of z of x, we're going to, be going to be substituting it inside this expression. So we get negative k b e to the power of negative k epsilon. And then for this, we do something similar. We have negative epsilon, so it corresponds to the region x is smaller than 0. So that means we need to substitute negative epsilon into this expression. So we minus e k, and then e to the power of k, and then x is equal to negative epsilon, so negative epsilon. And this is equal to everything in the right-hand side. So negative 2m alpha divided by h bar square, and then xi of 0 incidentally is just equal to b, so we can just write this out. And then you can see that the b's, they actually cancel out. And then we can actually also take out the negative sign. So on the left hand side we have 2k e to the power of negative k epsilon equal to 2m alpha divided by h bar squared. So the 2's cancel out and then also when epsilon tends towards 0 this term is just going to become 1 because e to the power of 0 is just equal uh, to 1. So we can just take this away. This is just equal to 1. So in the end we get a very important result. We see that k is equal to m alpha divided by h bar squared. So what this means is that, recall k is actually a shorthand for us to write out all these terms over here. So now we can bring this term back out, and then we can see that this actually allows us to deduce what the energy level should be. So taking the h bar to the right hand side, and then square in both sides, we have negative 2me, and on the right hand side we have m square l square square divided by h bar square, and then you can see that this m, it cancels out. So you see that the energy level, E, is actually equal to negative m alpha squared divided by 2 h bar squared. So this is a very important result. So we have found the allowed energy level for the case of the potential being equal to negative alpha delta x. So for this potential, we have found the allowed energies. And then starting from this, we can actually move on to deduce what this B should be. Once we found B, then we would have completed our test. We would have found what xi of x should be. So in order to find b, we're going to have to normalize this function. So this is a process that should be pretty familiar with, that you should be pretty familiar with at this point. So we just take this function, we take the integral from negative infinity to infinity, and we let this be equal to 1. So in practice, you can see that for this term over here, we can actually break this integral up into two parts. So from 0 to infinity, we have b squared e to the power of negative 2kx dx. And then from negative infinity to 0, we have b squared e to the power of positive 2kx dx. So you can see that all I'm doing is just breaking up this function into two parts. So uh, you can see that uh, both of these integrals are actually equal to each other. So all you have to do is just to try to apply the substitution uh, u is equal to negative u is equal to x. So if you substitute this in, you'll find that this integral is actually equal to this one. So instead of writing out two integrals, I can just take this away and then put a 2 over here. So 2 times this integral. 
So you can see that the difference is instead of going from negative infinity to positive infinity, we're going from 0 to positive infinity. So I can pull all these terms out, and then we'll be integrating e to the power of negative 2kx, which is a fairly straightforward integral, so from 0 to infinity. So substitute in infinity, we get e to the power of negative infinity, that's just equal to 0. And then we have minus 1 over negative 2k. So it's minus because we, uh, we're going to substitute this in the second term. And then e to the power of 0, that's just equal to 1. And so you see that these cancel out, and these two cancel out. So you, see, you can see that we have the absolute value of b squared divided by k is equal to 1. So because of the normalization. So now you can see that we can actually deduce what our b should be. So we know that the absolute value of b squared is equal to k. And then we found that k is equal to, to this term over here, m alpha divided by h bar squared. So that means our b is equal to the square root of m alpha divided by h bar. So this is our b. So there we have it.